rebuild it. Yes. Em Emily Pillerton. Get it right. Yep. Perfect. You know I'm bad with names, so you guys, excuse me. But anyway, she had, the film is incredible. She goes to North Carolina with Matt, right? Mm -hmm. And they start something totally new and different, and there's resistance, there's drama, and she'll tell you all about that. But before we get to that, let's drill down. Why design and not something else? Um, so, well, I went to architecture school. Mm -hmm. and, um, but why architecture school and not something else? Because as a kid, so I grew up loving school. I really was like, a, I was a good student, but I was really, really curious, and I loved every subject. And I think architecture was the thing for me that um, allowed and required me to be a nerd about everything. Mm -hmm. Like, most people say, oh, well, you must be good at math, and I am. I'm good at math, but I'm also <laughs> really interested in history mm -hmm. and anthropology and science and materials and chemistry, and, like, you need an understanding of all those things in order to be a good architect. You can't just put up a structure. You have to know where is, where is it sitting, who's going to use it, how are they going to use it, what's the history of this site. Um, so I love architecture because it's that expression that... We all understand. I mean, we, we know the medium of, of buildings, and a yes. good building is transformative. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Especially if, it's a, especially if it's a living space. Mm -hmm. Especially that. And what you said, what goes into it. I look at it like, from the outside, it looks always pretty. But then what you put into it, as you just said, our, uh, math, there's probably science in it and everything, for this structure to hold up. I'm so sorry. One second. No, no. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead. Live to tape, everybody. <laughs> you okay? Recovering from cough. Go okay. Ahead. All right. <clears throat> Why North Carolina and not somewhere else? Um. Yeah. So North Carolina sort of chose us. Um, okay. I'm a Bay Area native. Mm -hmm. The rural South is like the opposite of the Bay Area. Yes. But I, I fell in love with it. You know, I we were invited there by a superintendent who had. Dr. Z. Uh, Dr. Z, who had yes. a lot of really crazy ideas that eventually, crazy good ideas mm -hmm. that eventually led to his um, dismissal. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> you know, that's the kind of person that I want to work with. Like, I mm -hmm. want to work with the people on the fringe who are ruffling yes. feathers, and even if one of their crazy ideas works out, it's right. game-changing. So he invited us to come there and bring some of our design and construction knowledge to revamp the school district, both in its environments and in its um, general approach to teaching. And so we did a couple, we did um, four playgrounds, three computer labs, a weight room for the football team, a graphic design campaign for the whole county, um, and then that was a year. And then right. at the end of the year, we we said, okay, like now this is where the rubber hits the road. If we're really going to talk about design within public education, it has to be in the classroom. Like, you can't just fly in and build something where the kids are the beneficiaries and not right. give them access to it. Right. So the class, Studio H, emerged from, from that. Like, mm -hmm. we'd done all these things, and it was time we fish or cut bait, and Dr. Zollinger was this amazing partner that gave us a green light to put design in the classroom, mm -hmm. really with carte blanche. Like, whatever we wanted to do, he was, he was down for it. Right. Um, so that was really exciting for us. Right. Now, you ran into resistance in the film. You ran, and it's interesting because that board represents <laughs> a lot of places. They're getting all this money, and you guys worked for, like, they didn't they didn't pay you guys. Yeah. Yeah, we played chicken with them a little bit. And they, mm -hmm. so what happened, the short version, is right. that... Um, Dr. Zollinger made a lot of changes really quickly, and one of, you know, he brought in Teach for America and all these really amazing things, and um, I think for the powers that be, it was too, too much change too fast, okay. and yeah. there's a little more backstory to it than that, but that's what it came down to, and um, so when he left, everything that he loved or created was on the chopping block, and we were definitely at the top of the list, and um, so when they said to us, we're tearing up your contracts and not paying you anything, I really think they expected us to pack up and leave. And What kept you there? Because a lot of people would have said, okay, fine, we're done, we don't even know these folks, we're gone. No, they didn't know what they were dealing with. We were not going, we, they did not know that, that we 
that meant nothing to us. We were like, okay, fine, we'll make it work. Well, those kids, we knew our students at that point. We we had spent time with them. We had spent time with their families. I had raised $150,000 in grant funding. We had built out a shop. We weren't going anywhere. And even if they had said, like, we're going to burn your house down, I, we would have made it work because we had a responsibility to those students. And the biggest injustice is that no one was acting on their behalf. This the students were also saying, we want this class, and no one was listening to them. So we felt like it was our responsibility to be the ones acting on their behalf. And if they wanted this class, and we had the tools to provide it, then we were going to make it happen. I mean, it's a very intense film. And as I said, the school, uh, that board, or whatever, the school board just looked, you know, as we've seen over in different cities. Mm -hmm. They're like that. And what yeah. kept you. And now, what you did reminded me of back in when I went to school, those metal shop and wood shop, mm -hmm. which now they've gotten rid of because you got your hands actually dirty mm -hmm. and it felt so good. So you bringing that back, because it seemed, it worked. I mean, as far as the movie, it worked wonderfully. You had them thinking a different way. Yeah, yeah. There is a different, I don't know the cognitive science behind it, but mm -hmm. I know experientially that kids or people in general, but especially kids, their brains work in different ways when their hands are also working. And we wanted to bring back that legacy of shop class, but with a twist that was meaningful in 2010, 2011, when we were doing the project. Like, let's bring back the opportunities to build stuff, but let's add in this component of design. I'm not going to hand you a set of plans and say, go build that birdhouse. I'm going to tell you... Let's design homes for birds that are the coolest things you've ever seen and that are responsive to the habitats and the needs of those birds. So they're actually invested in the success of the project. Yeah, and that there is a sense of voice in it, too. Mm -hmm. Like, my design is going to look different than his design, and it's an expression of who I am, but it's also in touch with the people that are going to use it. And that's where architecture is special, because you're building something for the use of for use by someone else. Right. So there's that, there's a built-in empathy and you have to design it in a way that it, it comes from you and it's an expression of you, but it's for someone else. And you have to understand who that someone else is and design it with their needs in mind. The house he built in Detroit. Yes. Oh, that, oh, that scene just, it saddened me and it got me angry. Yeah, but you know what? It's also the reason why Studio H existed the way it did because We've all, I've done projects like that, that in hindsight, I'm like, that was horrible. That was a horrible failure. What was I thinking? Mm -hmm. And the lesson that Matt learned in Detroit, which I've learned in my own yes. failure project mm -hmm. projects, is that nothing matters if it doesn't come from the ground up and if it isn't built by people that feel an ownership. And so yes. Matt, his story is, is sad on one hand, mm -hmm. but it's also a great lesson in, yes. like, Studio H, everything that came out of it was from, like, the hearts and souls and blood and sweat of yes. our students. So yes. even if we walk away, if we get hit by a bus, that belongs to those students. Right. Yeah. I like that part. And you were also, I thought, sneaking in some life lessons for the students, too. You know, well, think of it like this. Think of it, yeah. do it like that. You know, we could, I thought, like, Jamisha, mm -hmm. I thought they are going to buy me a bike. Have to help you no, you're going to build it yourself out of oh, four old okay. bikes that you right. thought were broken. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's good. That, you know, design for me, like, mm -hmm. I, you hear the word design, and I, it, I think your brain goes to this, like, luxury lamp store or something. That's how it's been presented. Which is know. just, that's a whole <laughs> other interview. But, um, yes. <laughs> no, I mean, design mm -hmm. for me is just, like, critique and improvement. And if, uh, if I can teach a student how to look at the world and ask, why is it that way? Why isn't it better? Here's how it could be better, and I'm going to build it. Like, mm -hmm. that's, that's it. So with Jamisha and her purple bike, she, yeah, her instinct and what she had been accustomed to believing is that if I need a bike, someone will buy it for me. Yes. And we said to her, that's one way to do it. Or we have four broken bikes, and together mm -hmm. they have all the parts you need, so let's build it. And she felt an ownership over that bike in a way that you can never feel an ownership over something that you buy. Mm -hmm. um, I think for a kid to be able to point at something and say, I made that or I built that is yes. like the most empowering thing. Yes. I love it.
now. Studio H stands for Humanity, Habitat, Health, and Happiness. Why those four particular four words? Because when I went to write the mission statement for for the organization, and it didn't have a name yet, mm-hmm. that's the best I could come up with. <laughs> um, you know, Project H was born out of a frustration that I had with my own career as an architect and feeling like it was totally disconnected from anything that mattered. So I wrote, like, all these notes um, about the kinds of projects I wanted to do and the goals that I had as a, selfishly from, from myself. And those four words, and a lot of other H words, kept coming up. And mm-hmm. so Project H, the organization, was born out of, out of that idea that design can be for human beings it can have it can come from the heart um it should require your hands it should instill a sense of happiness um it's not this crazy luxury thing it's just like a way to create beauty and like solutions every day before we run out of time so i know you gotta go um the three projects i have here cornhole that's a whole different connotation when you're yeah. here than back. Some people call like, it what bags. The yeah. Heck? <laughs> Which I don't know if bags is better or worse, yeah. but cornhole. Yeah. Chicken coop. Yep. And the farmers market. Yeah. What challenges was it for you to go from the cornhole all the way to the farmers market? Because that was an incredibly big project. Yeah. Um, I mean we tried to be really strategic in in phasing those projects so that each one the students came out of a very specific lesson that then yes. when we introduced the next one, they felt equipped to do it. So with the the cornhole boards, for those of you who don't know, yeah. um, cornhole is this beanbag toss game, and there's there are two boards, and they're two by four feet. Right. So, you know, it up. yeah, mm-hmm. and they're tilted up. They have a hole, yes. throw the beanbag in the hole. Um, as an object, they're not that interesting. But as a first project for our students, it was fun. There was no, like, heavy social agenda. It was just... Here's this thing that we all play. Right. Let's understand how they're made, and mm-hmm. let's build one really, really precisely. Um, so the lesson for the cornhole boards was twofold. One, just craft and precision. Like, in a wood shop, if you are off by a sixteenth of an inch here, you'll probably be off by an inch down here. <laughs> um, so take the time. It's the old measure twice, cut once lesson. Um, and then secondly, most cornhole boards have, like, a John Deere logo on it or a Coca-Cola logo on it, um, which is lame. So we said to (laughs) our students, you know, if this is a canvas, it's it's a wood board that is a canvas for some kind of graphic. Um, So what's another way that we can look at it that's cooler and, like, more of a Mm -hmm. statement than the John Deere logo? Um, So we gave them this challenge um, working in 2D and graphic design um, to represent a concept in two different colors using some geometric um, applications. And the graphics are beautiful. I mean, like, the what they came up with were so, I mean, just some of the most beautiful patterns and tessellations and graphics that you've, that I've ever seen. And um, so the lesson from that was also that the thing that you're used to, you can do it cooler. Yes. Um, so then when we went to the chicken coops, that was, we wanted them to go into it with that. When I said chicken coop, instead of thinking about a box with a roof on it. And with chicken bar, because that's what I thought. Thing. I said yeah. chicken coop. Hmm. Yeah. But then... So I want them to push the boundaries, because they just learned how to do that. Yes. Um, and then with the, the lesson for the chicken coop was, how do you design a space that something can live in with the needs of that thing in mind, in this case a chicken? Um, so we spent, like, hours observing chicken behavior and coming to understand... How do they feel comfortable? How do they like to eat? And what does that mean spatially? Like, do we need to build them a separate room for them to sleep in? Or do they want to be, you know, so all of these behaviors influence the design. Um, So then when they went to the farmer's market, they're thinking about the client. Like, it's not a chicken anymore, but who are we designing for? What do they need? What kind of air and light and materials, like, does this thing, should this thing be built out of? And how should it accommodate um, natural elements and human traffic and, you know, the way people move through space. So it was all sort of scaffolded in a way that when we got to this 2,000 square foot building, they really had all the tools they needed already. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was just a matter of putting it all together. Right. Now, what lessons did you learn from hanging out in North Carolina? Now you're back in here, up here in Berkeley. Yeah, so Bertie County, North Carolina, and Berkeley are probably the two most 
polar opposite Opposites. places in the country. Yes. Um, but I felt like it was really important to prove that it could exist in both places and that there really is a universal approach. Uh, the project may change, but the heart of what we do and the way that our students work in our classroom is exactly the same. Um, we're at Realm Charter School in Berkeley now, and we have 216 students <laughs> instead of 10. Paid. We are getting paid. Ah, um, yes. <laughs> but more importantly, we're in a place where where we have the support of a school community right. that is not only giving us a green light, but asking us for more all the time. I mean, we have 8th, 9th, 10th, and 11th graders now. Um, I have an after-school girls camp and a summer camp, and... The lessons that we took from Bertie County were, I mean, we owe everything to Bertie County in a way. That's where we learned how Toughened to, you how up, to so fail. To speak. Yeah, yeah, how to, how to, how to really connect to kids. Like, there's, there's so many classrooms that I walk into, and there's a teacher standing up here and 30 kids in desks, and it's just tired. Like, that's, we've done that for 200, 300, however many hundred years, and that's not the way kids learn. Mm -hmm. So I think the things we learned in Bertie County were about the type of classroom we want to have, the type of student, and th the things that we can give to them that they'll carry throughout the rest of their lives. Um, and more than anything, just that like people consistently underestimate kids. And, True. and you give them the right space and the right voice, and they will blow your mind. And so being in Berkeley now, it's just at a bigger scale. Like, if I can do that with 10 kids, what can I do with 216? I was really, I'm serious. It just, and it also choked me up when you hand wrote, it really did, yeah. when you hand wrote the letters to the students. They weren't form letters. They were actually like, we really appreciate you. And I think it was a football player who was at the car, sunglasses on. He says, I'm glad I had these sunglasses on. Because you could see he was going to cry. Yeah. And that's what I mean about those kids, like, the, the best teachers that I ever had mm -hmm. had that kind of relationship with me. They, they would write me handwritten letters, you know, they, they knew my family, like, I really felt like they, they believed in me and cared about me as a person. And so all of my students in the film, and then even now, like, I take all the tools away, all the projects away, like, mm -hmm. the students just need to feel like they're supported and loved and that... They already are brilliant, and that we're the ones holding them back. You know, like so. What can we give to them to to bring all of that brilliance back to life? Yeah, and I can't recall each individual name, but I know one of them. First one in his family went to college. Stevie, yeah. Because of you guys, it was it was like, wow, that's yeah. that's huge. That is huge. I to tell people to so don't play that short. To all the generations, yeah. Something sparked. I want to go to college, and it was. That kid's awesome. He's Stevie. Is, he's the poster child for what Studio H can do. All of them just fantastic. Yeah. Well, folks, she's got to run to a... <clears throat> um, where do you got to go again? I got to get back to Berkeley. Yeah, school, you know, obligations, students. PTA, Parents students. Teams Association, okay? Don't be afraid to say it. <laughs> I used to go to PTA meetings, too, so, yeah. Emily Peloton, if you build it. Go out, support the film when it comes out. How can people reach you, contact you if they're really interested in what you're doing? Um, projecthdesign.org is the mm -hmm. website for our organization. You can look at the current projects, past projects. Um, we have a whole toolbox. All of our lesson plans are all available to anyone. Just take them. Um, and information about the girls' camp, the film, it's all there. Perfect.